introduce is Keith Ward. I'm a cheat sheet to know what he does. So. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, vegetation monitoring. It's a presentation largely from Paul of Ward. Uh, it's got a uh, condition monitoring uh, project with Living Murray. But I'm going to insert a couple of my older material because it gives it uh, some other context. Paul, by the way, is enjoying a holiday in China. So uh, she left me at home. Yeah. So I want to see the thing, Essentially, uh, this is a project which uh, each, each year there's seasonal monitoring being undertaken in the forest. There's 11 wetlands being intensively studied with transects and quadrats. So, um, yeah, each year, the, each season, there's a progress report that details the data and that goes into final reports. But essentially, there's a lot of complexity in the natural environment, of course. And the value of repeat monitoring in the natural environment over time captures that complexity. Uh, and things like this particular year, where monitoring was undertaken with, with huge flood events, and also some quite dry periods. And then the following years might be a reversal of that. It's been really interesting to see uh, the change in vegetation. And of course, rainfall as well, just how that interacts. And this project, well, my, my original work started in 1990 on the floodplain, and then that went to about 94. And then we had the opportunity to re-establish a lot of the, the same quadrats, the exact same spots in 2005, and monitor them ever since, uh, just to see the change over time. Uh, and some of these individual quadrats are 20 by 20 metres. They can have a, a fair diversity of plants. Here we've got about 40 species. Interestingly, about half of them are exotics, but they're really low players. And this, this native and exotic interplay with seasons has been really interesting. So how's it been used? Well, essentially we've got uh, the, the, the monitoring with the heap of data, progress reports, and a final report. So for each year that, that's being undertaken, it's building up this body of knowledge for the, the system. And that's going into adaptive management. So we say, well, we've got an idea of actually what's going on, how the, the vegetation's responding, and how that might require environmental water or other management. Uh, there's been a lot of presentations on that type of work over the years to community groups and, and scientific forums. Uh, the photos that come out of these type of things uh, get used much more than just vegetation monitoring. I think most of the uh, reports and, and the like uh, around it have got some of the photos from board. And, um, yeah, media. A lot of it's being reported in grey literature and there's a, quite a large body of, of reports available. And on the table, I think there's a list that Joe had printed out from the MDB, MDBA website that has a lot of the reports. Um, but it's also, some of it's being written in, in scientific literature, often with co-authors, uh, particularly with CSIRO. Um, other projects are being fed into a lot of the data, the Murray Flow Assessment Tool for working out um, required volumes of water on floodplains. Um, Jane Roberts' book with, with um, Arsden and the Choke Study in the Basin Plan. It basically feeds into that and goes with everyone's research and monitoring. It's those little bits of information that gets into this. And of course, the incidental observations that agencies shouldn't be underestimated. Because we have researchers and, and people monitoring out in the field, they're going by default to come across some rare and threatened species or interesting observations, and they too get fit in. So the, the value of, I think, monitoring being largely put in by MDBA for, for these type of programs has a lot of other spin-offs. And that includes other research and monitoring. So you know, we've got strong links with these other programs. And this goes for, for everyone's, everyone's work. Interestingly, at the moment, the, uh, a lot of this work, because of the, the duration of the data, and you know, Scott was talking about the, the, how long the fish monitoring has been going. Uh, they're actually becoming quite long-term data sets, which are really rare <laughs> in the uh, in, in the world. And places or, or groups like the um, Australian Centre for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, or ACS, um, is collating a lot of these long-term data sets 
uh, to analyse them in a lot more rigour to look for uh, trends of change in the Australian landscape. And I'm working with Ralph and others on that one and, and Lindsay. So, some, some pictures. I'll stand over here. Just quickly go through these. Uh, this is a, a, a giant rush example of how effective the drought has been. So really we've got um, the, the seasons in columns, spring, summer, autumn, winter, and then the years. Uh, this is the Russian swamp. And you can see that the rush was basically degraded during the drought. And then when we got the flooding, which really went for two and a half years, it's just extraordinary. So we've gone from extreme drought to extreme flood, um, how the Russians responded. And as Lindsay was pointing out, it's a formidable beast to come back. Uh, however, giant rush is an indigenous species, so we're not trying to eliminate it, but we're just trying to peg it where it should be. <coughs> so in locations where it, it currently exists and it forms one of the big uh, colonial water bird breeding sites, we're actually managing for it. And during the drought, this stuff was degrading. And if we got a flood, the birds wouldn't have anywhere to nest in that first year because the rush is just so brittle. Um, it, it just wouldn't be habitat. So we actually put an environmental water allocation into this particular wetland for the brush, and it responded uh, to, as it would. And we are actually managing for the brush in this instance. And incidentally, we did get colonial water bird breeding there. Uh, Phragmites, uh, we've got wetlands where it had been burnt by a bushfire, um, it had been to, um, described in the media as being completely devastated and destroyed. But of course, during the drought, not a lot responds because there's not a lot of moisture. As soon as we start getting the rain in um, spring of 2009, it started to grow back. And it got, you know, as Phragmites does, very tall and dominated at the site. But we haven't had a lot of flooding, well, we're in the dry phase and it's degrading. But it will spring back. We've got other bird sites. This one's uh, high in the terrace, so we're off the floodplain proper uh, into the, the swampy uh, woodlands. There's a site in New South Wales that have been burnt. The drought had created a lot of bare ground and it's quickly colonised by, maybe not quickly because it was, took a couple of years without rainfall, but once we got to the rainfall, a lot of introduced exotics started to appear. Uh, and they dominated until it got flooded. And once it got flooded, we had this massive reversal of, of plants, and it was now dominated by um, nearly exclusively native species, which is really quite amazing. <coughs> Another site, the, Mo the Mora Grass uh, Plains, where we don't have rain rejection floods. Um, so this is the Russian swamp that's got a particular work to the basin of the, the wetland, but it's just high enough on the landscape that it doesn't get the rain rejection flows. And I think it's for that reason that it's one of the best sites. And when it does flow, it tends to hold floods for a good duration. Again, we get our rainfall, mora grass sprouts to a certain length, but it's not until it actually gets flooded that it grows really quick. And in past research has shown this will grow you know, 21 millimetres a day and get to four metres in length. But we didn't get a dry phase. And it just kept flooding. Every time it started to, to dry down, we get another flood pulse. And um, it kept it flooded. And you can see the change in the structure. And this is why just a, a single measure in the environment can give you a really misleading result. But repeated measures of, of anything uh, makes the picture a little bit clearer. This is the same sort of wetland, more grass plain, but in an area just around a corner that does get flooded by rain rejection flows. And rainfall comes, something sprouts, but it's not more grass. Um, basically nothing grew. We had mud flats, winter tide went out, or the, the flows dropped. And instead it was colonised by a, a suite of native species, but early colonisers, things like uh, centipede and um, ultimanthera. Uh, and going up on the elevation again, um, the tree calm seed zone, similar to, to Bruce's finding, once we got flows, or well, initially rainfall, but when the shallow flooding occurs, we got big responses, and now we're entering a dry phase. 
So very robust, those upper ends. And once you get out onto those low rises, we get a lot of exotics, and this is where people see the exotics because that's where all the roads are. Um, very disturbed areas, been a lot of barley grub digging, and of course we get a lot of weeds once it rains. Um, and unless we get it flooded, which is very difficult, the weeds tend to dominate. So in terms of other impacts, um, these are only uh, anecdotal observations. We don't have a lot of data for this, but we do know that uh, cows eat grass, uh, whereas they tend not to eat the giant rush or red gums and things like that. So they tend to concentrate on the more aggressive plains. Some plots that we had in the forest back in the uh, early 1990s had shown that uh, some of these plots, these were designed to exclude everything, um, the netting. The kangaroos jumped in there in preference, of course. <laughs> uh, the one in the back didn't have the netting, so that was allowed kangaroos in. And they, but the similar results, it's pretty stark. When it returned flooded, the, the impact still residual. And the same here, another fence line. Um, once it uh, dried out a little bit, you can see there wasn't a lot there until we packed up the fences and went home. And I mean, there's no area for a frog really to hide there. Uh, Pugging's been expanded as uh, a potential uh, saviour of these areas because they create microclimates. Um, they're probably the things that are growing in these pubs are probably because they can't get their head down into them. And of course, we've got a lot of feral horses and the feral horse management plan that the current government has got a status quo, so we're, we're keeping those in. As Lindsay was alluding to, the best way to find more grass plains is basically to find the, the feral horses. So, really, we do have the issue of the giant rush and also red gum dominating the floodplains, and um, yeah, this stuff is now starting to sprout back. So, in terms of take home messages, clearly rainfall and flooding. Um, um, will influence what's actually growing out there and it'll vary over time. The flooding tends to reduce the exotic species in favour of natives and you can get a quick turnaround of different species assemblages and some of that's been written up with uh, uh, Stokes and Mount It's been really interesting to see this ex extreme drought and then the extreme flood sequence um, it's been a great natural experiment to see a lot of these things and looking at a variety of sites within the forest can also give you uh, some pseudo replication of those sites. But there's so much variability out there and the Mora grass plain contraction is, is a big problem. It's a massive concern and we're hoping the dry regime we've got now and hopefully soon to follow the, the winter spring flooding um, will all go well for it. But certainly the length of the dry and the length of the wet wasn't all that good. Grazing pressure is variable, but it appears to be sleeping for some species. I mean, those uh, photos showed a fairly residual impact. Um, and of course, you know, it all boils down to, you know, the strong se uh, seasonal, the, the, the winter and spring flooding, followed by a good dry in summer and autumn. Um, it follows that uh, it must be the, the better for the under three vegetation of Ireland. So I shall leave it there and ask for questions.